Hello, my friends. Welcome to We're Made Digital. I'm your host, Joanne LaFleur. We are in episode four today, and we're talking to Stephen Brewster. You're going to love this conversation. Brewster is from, originally I met him at Cross Point Church in Nashville, and he does all kinds of church consulting now. He works with people like Elevation Worship, works with Catalyst. He's working with Jenny Katrin, doing coaching for creatives with Get Foresight. You're going to love this conversation. He's all about leading creative teams. He's the kind of guy who passes out his phone number to people he actually wants you to call him or to text him as a creative communicator in order to get help and coaching from him he's that kind of guy so we're talking about systems and structures that that are going to help you thrive creatively and how to get leaders to trust you because of your systems and structures we're getting into the nitty-gritty of the agenda of what his creative meetings look like who comes to them and how they come up with their ideas of their videos and their names we're going to talk about that whole process we're also going to have conversation for a little bit about how you recover from being hurt by someone in leadership. How do you not get jaded and uh, give up on doing ministry? If someone in leadership over you, a good friend or a pastor, turns out to not be who they said that they were. Uh, And that's something that he's gone through himself. And so we're going to have a bit of a conversation about that. We're looking at leadership as not being the doer, but forecasting for the better. And we're looking at how not to take everything personal and not be too sensitive as a creative person. It's going to be a great conversation overall. You're going to love it. Uh, Stephen Brewster is the real deal. I can't wait to get into the conversation. So thanks again for, for listening to the podcast. Thanks for subscribing, telling your friends, rating, and reviewing the podcast. It means so much to me as we're getting the word out there and growing this community. And so without further ado, here is our conversation with Stephen Brewster. You're listening to the Word Made Digital Podcast. Podcast with Joanna LaFleur, where we discuss all things creative and communications for the church. The church carries the best news in the world, so we want to help you be the best creatives and communicators in the world. Let's go. Well, welcome, Stephen Brewster, to the podcast. I'm so glad you can join us today. Thanks for having me. It's so much fun. I love getting to hang out with you and uh, getting to hang out with the, the people that listen to your amazing content. So. <laughs> well, yeah, well, to be determined after the, the we're going to raise the bar here today. I mean, I, I've been looking forward to talking to you because you live and breathe church creative uh, every day and you've been doing this for a long time. So, I mean, sort of easy answer up front. Tell us who you are. What do you do? Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> my name's Steve and I love hip-hop music and um, basketball and oh that's probably not what you want to know <laughs> so uh, I've worked in, in local church for a long time before that I was in the music business um, and uh, spent a, a ton of time at Cross Point Church in Nashville Tennessee Nashville's home and um, worked at Integrity Music helped run the marketing team there for a little while I've been all over the place Coty Records back in the day for all the old uh, CCM fans, um, and so yeah, and now today I'm, I'm kind of like exploring some new endeavors and, and and taking some new chances. So some really fun stuff on the horizon. And so that sounds like uh, you've come out of a bunch of different church contexts, but now you are um, dabbling into a whole new world. Yeah, of- I am. I, you know, I love the local church. It's it's it's. Uh, um, it, it's vital for me to be involved mm-hmm. with the local church. I, I, I adore it. And so um, in this season of life, um, I kind of feel like God has permissioned us to go explore helping our friends get better. And so we're just working with people that we love to help them do what they love and do it as, as well as they can do it. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I mean, I want to get, get into that a little bit later with you around like why you love this uh, I love this, it. I this love big, it. wonderful mess called church. <laughs> but, um, okay, so so you're, you're in this creative context. You're often leading creative teams. It's really, you know, what I think a lot of people listening, maybe ha- if they know who you are, they know you as a guy who, who does creative leadership. Yeah. Um, and so, like, how did you get, have, how did you get into this? Like, I mean, obviously you, you were working in music, but have you always been a creative? Were you the kid on the playground organizing art? 
you know, I was definitely like the kid who loved yearbook class more than math class. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I've always loved music. Like music has been just like something I've been super, super passionate about. Always loved music. Always loved. I, I mean, it's funny. We're, we're doing some, some cleanup stuff right now. And I found this old box of stuff from when I was a kid. And like, there's all these pictures that I drew back when I was a kid. And like, I've just always loved that. I've always loved art and, and, I've always, but I think what I've loved the most is the artist. I love I love creative people, and so creative people are my tribe. Like they're the people that I just I flock to, and um, so it's super fun to get to 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 do life with young creative leaders and just help them kind of learn to navigate the things that I've had to learn to navigate being an older twenty nine year old as opposed to an average twenty nine year old. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, even when you talk about um, the younger, I think it's the stereotype of creative work, and, and certainly if creative umbrellas, worship ministries for churches, is that it's young people who do it. Um, but of course, creativity doesn't end at 29 or whatever you just, you know, so so why do, why do you think that is? Why, why is this sort of a, a young people sport? Well, I think it's, I think that we're drawn to young people because uh, young people tend to, to um, steer culture a little bit more. Mm. And so when you look at pop culture and you look at who is influencing pop culture, it's usually young people. And so um, they've got new ideas, they've got new ways to, to do old things, and uh, they problem solve the cre- creatively, differently. And really, creativity is problem solving, and so they find ways to, to problem solve differently, and so we're like drawn to that. Um, cr- young creatives left to their own devices are going to make the same mistakes that old creatives made when they were young creatives, and so it's <laughs> I think to have seasoned advice or seasoned voices involved in the conversation from time to time, just to help everybody get go further faster. Yeah. And so, uh, like, what's that been like for you, the transition from doing creative work to leading creatives? Yes. Uh, I, I know you've done some, you've done, you've had some, some thoughts out in the world about this. I'd love you to dissect that a little bit. Yeah. Hardest transition I ever made. Hmm. I was, I was doing like my job and I loved it and I designed a little bit and and that kind of thing. And I remember my boss came in and she's actually coming to your church, Jenny Katrin. Um, she came into my office one day and she's like, if you design one more thing, I'm firing you. And I'm like, oh, what are you talking about? She's like, I didn't hire you to create. I hired you to lead creatives. And at that day, it was like, boom, oh my gosh, I have got to make the shift from being a doer to being a leader. And wow. it's super hard because so much of our identity and our personal belonging, value, whatever – however you d- dissect that, is caught up in the things that we make. And yes. we forget God cares lo- much more about who we're becoming than what we're creating. And so um, what is the, what's what been fun for me is watching the shift from creating art to creating artists. And so my art now are the people that God um, allows me to steward their lives and, and speak into and, and lead. Wow. Yeah. And, and I can appreciate there'd be some grief in that process. Yes. Of like letting go of, and, and maybe like an identity shift. And some guilt. Some mm. guilt too because you're like, I don't feel like I'm contributing. Like I'm not in the, I'm not in the trenches anymore. I'm not, you know, I remember, I remember one time, like I told my wife, she's like, are you coming home? And I'm like, yes, I'm going to come home. But I feel terrible because my team's all here working. And so I went home and then I came back a couple hours later with some pizza because I was just like, I want to be with them. Like, those are my people. I got, I, I, it's not fair for me to not work and them to work. But, um, and then as I grew into being a, a leader, I realized that I'm, I was working in very different ways and times than they were as well. So, right. Uh, very interesting process for sure. Very painful. Um, uh, but, but so valuable and so rewarding and, I'm so thankful that I was, I think a lot of people don't get to make that, uh, they don't clear that hurdle well. And I had awesome people around me that helped me clear that hurdle well. And when they did that, they did that, it it changed everything. So as you've moved from 
being the creative to leading the creatives, pastoring the creatives. I hear your pastoral heart, but you also have stuff you just got to get done. Like there's deadlines, there's realities. How do you, how do you build systems? <laughs> how do you communicate to your team? This is what we want to do. How do they, how do they, how does that work out with you as they get back to you with their content? How, what yes. have you built? So, I mean, as your organization scales, your process has to scale as mm-hmm. well. And so, you know, I work super hard to help create a process for our team that set them up to win, um, you know, creative meetings that were, that were going to lift, give them lift as opposed to be burdensome for them. Um, building more timeline into our process. Uh, the average person attends church 1.3 times a month, mm-hmm. uh, according to Barna. So if that's true, then we know that you have to promote something three weeks in a row for it to touch everybody one time. So the minimum promotion you should ever do for an event that's a, a major event is three weeks. Um, for three weeks of promotion, we need five weeks of production time. So everything had to be a minimum of eight weeks out. And everybody that's listening is like, oh, I wish I could do that, but I can't. And actually you can because you're, you're, each ministry sits down in January and create, or in November at some point in the end of the year or the first year, they sit down and create a calendar for the year. Mm-hmm. They know when and most of those things are going to happen. And when we put those big rocks into the process early, it gives us space to move on the God things, to move on the moments when our pastor walks in and says, hey, someone just gave us a building and we have to put new signage up everywhere and we have six days to do it. How do we, what are we going to do? Yeah. And so, of course, you know that, like, for example, you know Christmas comes every year. Christmas, you... <laughs> Easter. Uh, you're going to do a, you're going to do at least two evangelistic outreach focused series a year. You're going to do a relationship series. Kids are going to go to camp. Uh, you're going to have BBS. There's going to be two, at least two small group um, launches every year. So like we know this stuff, right? Like yeah. none of this is a secret or a surprise. However, we always feel pretty surprised when it pops up. <laughs> wait, 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 we're doing small groups. We've never done this before. Except yeah. for the three times we did it last year. <laughs> I mean, it's so true. I mean, that's always the uh, the wrestle with creativity is doing it within timelines. Uh, and that's where I think, you know, bosses, leaders, senior pastors can get very frustrated with creative people who don't seem to get a handle on that kind of stuff. And then it becomes my responsibility to keep us ahead. So. Yeah. Like I shouldn't be sitting there wondering why the graphic designer hasn't created the, the, the Christmas graphic if I haven't given them art direction and pointed them towards what the goal and the win is. And so if I do that in October or November, then I have a, a better chance of it being successful. And so as a leader, your part of you becoming the leader, not the doer, is forecasting better. Right. And so what does that look like when you're you're talking about giving a brief to your team? What what would be the elements that are included when okay, here here's what we're going to do guys. Here's here's the parameters for that. What what would that look like? So I'm going to get as much information as I can from my pastor. Find out, you know, why he's inspired to do this, what the mood is, what are the the, the felt needs we're going to reach, what are the promises we're going to make. I'm going to ask those kind of questions. Um, from there, I'm going to then do a creative meeting. And usually there's about 10 things that we want to accomplish in a creative meeting. We never accomplish all 10, but we try. Um, We need a title and a subtitle. We need music. We need a video. We need a look or graphic idea, right? We need a marketing idea. We need social media ideas. Uh, We want to know how this is going to act or interact with other ministries in the organization. What's it going to look like in the lobby and the parking lot and, um, and then what are the creative elements that we're going to do on stage? So if I can come up with those, at least an overarching umbrella for those 10 things and put them into a mood board or something, then at that point, I'm giving my team space to go and create. And what I'll usually do is I'll do that in advance. And then we'll do Sorry, a big- you mean you're, you're not coming, though, with the title and the subtitle and the ideas for it? You mean here's just the things we need, to, we need coming out the other side? We need coming out of our creative meeting. And so, you know, when you sit down with your pastor, you guys, guys might come up with a title right away that you know is just rock solid. So don't waste time brainstorming yeah. a better title if you already have a great one. Um, the one thing that most teams never have is a really good video idea. And so we'll always do, do that as part of our creative meeting. 
and we'll invite as many people as we can into that room, usually 30 to 40, and uh, we'll try to break them up into teams, and we'll start off with that one. So if you were gonna create a 60-second commercial about this concept, what would this commercial be? I want you to create two of them. You have 17 minutes, go. Music comes up, people start working and in teams, timer runs, music comes down, each team pitches one of their ideas, and now you've just gotten six new ideas as opposed to the three people who are Googling or YouTubing in your normal creative meeting. Right, and so this is, you're talking about like, this would be a team of like volunteers. These are well, not, you're not talking about 60 staff members in a creative department. I, I mean, I people are already feeling discouraged when they think, that's, oh my goodness. The entire church. Um, yeah. <laughs> I want volunteers. I want people from other departments. I want people who don't go to my church. I want people who don't even go to church because honestly, that's who I'm trying to reach anyway. So why not get their ideas? Because that's the audience. And so, um, Oh, that's yeah. so interesting. You would you would be able to get people. I've never thought about this. You you'll get like friends of yours from the neighborhood, or I don't know your soccer team or whatever, to come and creative, do a creative go to cool coffee shops and find some cool people and be like, hey, we're having a creative meeting. I'd love to just pick your brain and have your ideas. We're gonna get feed you lunch for free. You want to come and do it? And they're like, sure. <laughs> yeah, I get. I mean, can't say no. I mean, if there's coffee, I guess coffee. I guess some people might show up. Coffee, candy. I mean, you can't go wrong with that. Yeah. Good and news. how often How often in a year would you have those kind of meetings with, like, are you bringing, like, you're bringing Christmas and Easter and fall launch all at once kind of a thing? or no. uh... Individual meetings for those individual mm. events. So, Got it. Um, you're probably going to do at least 10 of them a year. Um, you might do more. You might do a couple less. Um, it depends on your church and, the, and the, the style and structure of your church. Like, if your church is a church that does a ton of conferences and a ton of one nights and um, you do a kid thing and you, you might have to do more just to get more ideas flushed out and you might scale them down a little bit, but uh, I'd always do Christmas in July. Every year I did Christmas in July just cause it's the most fun to, it's always fun to like crank the airway down and make people wear ugly sweaters and, and <laughs> yeah. like, do, do that, you know? Um, and so, but yeah, I would say 10 a year. Yeah. In about 90 minutes each. Yeah. Then after that meeting, I would do an editing meeting with the original group, probably the normal three or four that you normally sit with. And I would put everything on post-it notes, color coded. And then, so all the videos are in pink, all the subtitles are in yellow or whatever. And then you just put them on the wall all next to each other. Cause I'm super visual. I need to see it. Yeah. And then, okay, this one doesn't work. We should save this one for later. That's a great idea. It just doesn't work for the series or we don't have margin for it or time, but most of us have like two good ideas yeah. when we have our normal Google creative meeting. Well, coming out of this meeting, you've got the six teams each presented an idea, so that's six ideas, but they actually came up with two ideas, so you have 12 ideas. To And, and in this editing meeting, it's 70% editing and 30% creative. So you might go, you know what, that could work for us. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And I mean, it sounds like when you're talking about 10 a year, um, every, every church has sort of different rhythms. I mean, there's churches who will, uh, they'll, they'll spend the entire year teaching one book right. of the Bible and then other people, there is no sense of a series. It's kind of just lots of one-offs. They maybe have lots of guest speakers or preachers depending on the style of church. And so, you know, how often, maybe those kinds of meetings need to happen probably depends but do you have i mean if you were to consult to a senior leader on ser sermon series length what do you think in your experience has been the right amount of time like if you're saying people come 1.3 times a month um what feels like a niche to you of people can engage a topic but they're not overwhelmed or they don't miss most of it so people attend 1.3 times a month i think people are engaged more than that so they're oh, yeah. listening to their to your YouTube or your your app or your podcast or whatever. So they're consuming the content, they're just not consuming it inside of the box like they used to. Yeah. Um, so to me, and, I, and there's a lot of churches that don't even mess with series anymore, but I what I like about a series is I believe that a series provides handles for people to put, um, to put invitation tools in the hands of people to invite them to their church, right? So, um, I like a four-week series. I think it's it's short enough 
that it, that the pastor stays engaged in it, um, and it's long enough that it can pick up some momentum. Sometimes you might want to go six weeks. Um, two weeks is really really hard on the creative team. Um, but then there's some churches, like you said, that'll they'll do a book of the Bible for 12 weeks or 15 weeks or 18 weeks. I, I think you have to be true to who you are. You have to be true to who you, and, and And the truth is, you could do a book of the Bible for the whole year and break it into six different series. Yeah. Like, like there's no, there's, you, there's a lot of ways to do it. And I think you do what's culturally right for you and what fits well inside of the ecosystem of your values. Yeah. Like in our church, we did... Uh... Most of this year we spent in 1 Corinthians. And so, yeah, it was three different series, all within the same book, all different brand and vibe to it. And then in between, we did breaks. So we would have we'd have natural breaks to talk about something topical like money or we'd talk about Christmas or, I don't know, family parenting. I don't know, the classic stuff that, yep. that, uh, that we break it up to talk about. Yeah, so we are more one of those going to talk about the same thing all year churches and so that's exactly it. you have to f what is the creative solution to this to keep it fresh um it's not a bait and switch it's how do you how do we keep everybody excited about this remembering why we started and why we're going to get to the end <laughs> we're going to get there i promise we're going to make it <laughs> yeah exactly we um so i remember one year we did romans that was a long year oh, that's a long Roman, year. romans was a long year <laughs> but that was a long long time always ago now than, always better than exodus though yeah yeah well and, and just even in that like i i think about it in a resourcing perspective too like as you said like two week series is tough on creative it's also tough on budgets if yeah. the expectation is to create new branding new content for every single series um, is there a way that some stuff can be grouped together or, or thinking through, can that video, like if we're shooting for video A, can we use that same location and group of people for video D because it's just going to cost too much if we're doing it every two weeks? Totally. And, and I think the more, the, and that's part of creative right there is how do you get creative in what you create? Like, so how are we going to put this together in a way that, that saves resource, saves time, um, uh, as I've gotten older in leadership, I, I fight harder and harder for the health of my team because mm -hmm. I don't want to see my team fizzle out, especially when I'm working with young leaders because they're so gung-ho that they need some help knowing where the boundaries need to be and permission to have boundaries. And, and unfortunately, in a lot of churches today, boundaries is a bad word. And, right. and I would say that um, if you're in a healthy environment, you can get everything done that needs to be done. It's not going to be everything done that you want to get done, but you start to learn how to, to build the systems around it so that it scales into what you exactly want to accomplish, not just what you need to accomplish. And so as a, as a leader, my, my responsibility is making sure that I keep my kids healthy and that I keep them, I keep them in a place where they're doing their best work. They're excited. They're protected. They're valued. They're making stuff that's pushing the envelope a little bit, but they're not they're not burning out and that they have weekends and family time and yeah. opportunities to enjoy life. Yeah. Well, and and you're talking about this. I'm, I'm thinking of this broader team. If you're, you're saying a number like 60 people are coming to a creative meeting, yeah. uh, but then there's the people who actually are hired or whether that's salary staff or contract. Yeah. Um, um, what are you looking for when you're thinking of, okay, there's a role to fill and we're going to pay somebody. Um, what, what's the kind of person that you're looking to hire? Because probably there's a lot of creative people listening who are like, I would love to be paid by my church to do this, but right now I'm doing it for free or uh, I'm working in an, another industry. How do I break into yeah. church context? Yeah. So, I mean, for me, it's always finding the person who's really – I, and I can only speak to myself. I think I think different leaders probably value different things. What I value is I want highly creative, um, nice people that I want to hang out with, that I get along with, um, but they're 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 willing to work super hard, but they're willing to be part of something bigger than themselves. And um, for me, most of the time, I'm always I'm not going to just go out and hire a position. I'm probably gonna you're going to start volunteering in that position 
And then eventually, like maybe I'll start contracting you a little bit, then I might hire you part time. And then you've proven to be so valuable that I just need you around all the time. And so it's not fair for me to not have you full time on, on the team. And so I try to make that transition that way at whenever I can, but that's yeah. not always optional, you know? Yeah, it's true. I mean, some and sometimes you need to hire some from someone from maybe outside. They're going to be moving across the country for the job, but but yeah, for the most part, you're looking for those people you're already working with. You've been you're not interviewing them, but you know them from working with them for maybe a couple of years. And if I'm hiring someone from outside, I'm spending a lot of time uh, on chemistry, character, and competency, mm. and so. Um, and I'm not trusting myself because I'm, I love new things. So I'm like, oh, you're cool. You're gonna do awesome here. And then you come in and you're a complete jerk and nobody likes you and then I have to fire you and it's so expensive to fire somebody. Um, so I am going to put a team together to help. Well, and in Canada, you can't really fire people. The laws here are different. <laughs> so if you've hired the first, if you've hired the wrong person on your team in Canada, you're stuck with them, kind of. I mean, it's mu- it's it's more complicated to fire someone, which means that you protect a worker. That's the positive side, right? It protects a worker from um, from being abused. That's its that's its original intent is to protect the employee. But on the employer side, you got to be very very careful. I mean, of course, it costs. It, whether that's financial or otherwise, there's a huge cost when someone has to be removed from a team, and it costs you equity with your team and trust, and that's yeah. something you can't afford to lose. And so um, I'm always looking to get other people's voice into that conversation because I don't trust myself. (laughs) And so I want to know that all of the people that I trust like this person too, so that we're making this decision together. Um, And I've already vetted whether they're competent enough to do the job, whether their character seems right. But chemistry experiments are expensive, so. (laughs) That's true. You know what? Actually, I, I live with a post PhD biochemist, uh, one of my roommates, I, I, random thing. And so she does experiments for a living. She's doing cancer research. And wow. I have discovered that she's doing experiments, literal chemistry experiments, that like one day she'll spend like $50,000 in I don't know what again this is how limited my not I'm clearly a creative person not a science person but but she's spending on whatever these ingredients are or the chemicals or the tools she has to use um I mean quite literally it's you know a person's salary for the year in some cases is what she's spending in a day so I mean, and and in a very similar sense, it's just as you say, it, there's a huge cost. You don't want to be doing the experiment on the job. You want to know uh, it's going to work. And you're doing that with people's tithe money. And so for yeah. me, it's an even heavier uh, responsibility that I can't afford to make that mistake. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, we, I'm, we all have known uh, mistakes that have happened, whether they've been on our teams or we've, uh, in our churches, maybe growing up, there's been problems or the teams we're on have had problems. We all see stuff in the news about churches that have problems. feels like every month there's some new mega church problem going on. And so how do you, uh, how do you remain hopeful and resilient in all that kind of stuff? I mean, we've all seen our, our share of stuff. Some of your stuff has maybe been a little bit more public in terms of some of your church involvements, but how do you, how do you deal with that and get up and do it again the next day? <laughs> well, if, I'm, if I'm just being candid and real, like a lot of the stuff that I walked through wasn't just church stuff, but it was like my friends. Hmm. And, and my best friends. And uh, so there was like, it's it's taken me a long time to re-identify the guy in the mirror a little wow. bit. I would say that it wouldn't, it wasn't until we're recording in like the end of May right now. And so I would say it wasn't until four or five months ago that I started to recognize myself in the mirror hmm. and go, oh wait, I remember that guy. We've been in counseling to try to find him. Um, and and the thing that I think that God has really, like, well, first off, he's protected me through the whole process from myself and from, from you know, what could have been the, the, the attacks of others. Um, 
additionally, um, I think he gave me some clarity that church never hurt me. People <laughs> hurt me that were in the church, but the church never hurt me. And then I think when I was able to kind of make that that uh, clarity, get that clarity, all of a sudden I was like, wow, okay, this, it's just people and people can hurt me anywhere. Yeah. And so I can't take this out on the, the one place where that's, that's designed to provide hope for our, for culture and humanity. Um, that's not fair. This is people, people acting the way they shouldn't act inside of an establishment that I've probably built an assumption or, or put some kind of pressure on somebody to uh, perform a certain way that they're not even capable of performing. And that's not fair to them or to me. And I wouldn't want those expectations. And so, uh, uh, God's been super gracious in that. Two quick things that I think helped me a lot. One, my, I, I was in, I've been in therapy for a long time. Um, I love, like, secretly I want to be a therapist. Okay, join up. Like, I really do. Like, <laughs> that's probably the for the kid is I'll end up being a therapist. But um, what, what I think has, one of my therapists told me this story about, um, it's a Chinese proverb about this farmer and I'll tell it to you really quickly. I, I did a YouTube video about it. It's on my, my Facebook page and my blog and stuff. But uh, this farmer um, uh, had a horse, horse ran away. The neighbor comes over and says, oh, it's so sad that your horse ran away. And he said, good or bad, who can say? Seven mm -hmm. days later, the horse comes back and he brings seven wild horses with it. The neighbor comes over and is like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like you have seven more horses. Now your farm can grow by like seven, hundred percent like this is unbelievable he said yeah good or bad who can say his son gets on one of the wild horses takes it for a ride falls off and shatters his leg the neighbor comes over and says oh your son broke his leg that's so sad good or bad who can say the next night the local town militia comes in and they knock on doors looking for able-bodied young warriors to go to battle which they will likely lose they look at his son and his son can't go to battle because his leg is is casted the neighbor comes over and goes oh it's so great your son hmm. leg was broken good or bad who could say and, and i think that one of the things that i've learned about my life in this season is that good or bad who can say you know hmm. good or bad i can't control what has happened i can't control other people but what i can control is my reaction to them right. and when i approach every day as good or bad who can say that's what really really matters um, then the other part, the other part uh, of it is um, this. I, and my I, my friend gave me this book. Uh, my friend Jason King, he's one of the most amazing dudes that I've ever met in my entire life. He uh, he's a music manager, um, one of my best friends. Anyway, he gave me this book called Living the Four Agreements, and the four agreements are basically this: be impeccable with your word, don't take anything personally, don't make assumptions, and always do your best. And literally, when you boil your life down to those four things, everything gets easier. Because being impeccable with your word is like, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to say kind things. I'm going to say only what I mean. And I'm going to spread love, not hate. Jesus was pretty impeccable with his word. Yeah. You know? Easier said it. than done. But <laughs> That's the funny thing is these four simplicities are so complex. Yeah. Right? Don't take anything personal. Nothing others do is because of you. I mean, Jesus lived that. He was on a cross because of other people, of me and you and the person yeah. listening today. Um, don't make assumptions. Find courage to ask questions and express what you really want and need. When you don't make assumptions about other people, everything gets simple. And then yeah. do your best. And your best is going to change. In the, the, I, I walked through a weird two years of my life. My best wasn't very good for a little while. Hmm. And today my best is maybe a little bit better, I hope. And so um, it's just fun to, 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 it's fun to see God use things to grow and develop you. So while I've walked through some craziness around church, I believe in it more than ever before. And I believe that it's still the hope and it's still the tool that God uses to reach people. And this weekend, there's going to be somebody who's been in your church for the first time ever. They've never been there before. And that's why you can't, can't settle or compromise or give less than your best. And it's never just another Sunday. Right. 
Yeah. Well, and, and I love that you talk about owning what you can own, which is yourself. Like taking, uh, when you talk about character, competency, chemistry, yeah. uh, it's this idea, like the character side. I mean, it's this idea of what can we control? How are we going to respond to it? What do we need to learn more about ourselves? Like you're talking about this idea of looking in the mirror and starting to see yourself again. I, I'm curious about that because... Uh, I think there have been times probably for a lot of us where we've not felt whether maybe that's described as people might say it different ways like I don't like who I'm becoming or I don't know this person anymore or you know I don't recognize myself right now or I don't feel comfortable in my own skin or like people if they want to get all biblical about it they'll talk about like it's David but he's wearing Saul's armor to go fight Goliath you know <laughs> people use people use like different ways to John talk about it joke about that at some point I <laughs> yeah like the ways the ways we talk about our problems as christians but but i guess i'm i'm curious is this in hindsight that you say oh i i now see myself in the mirror or was there a point where you said i don't know who i don't know well i who think this I is through a, a very traumatic experience and walking through that experience i got unhealthy myself and my world was unhealthy and everything around me was unhealthy. And so um, when I kind of crash landed out of that storm, I was in such a fog that I didn't even like, I remember like the, the first months after I left, left cross point, I landed at a great church in Florida for about five months. And I remember a couple of days sitting at my computer, just wondering what am I supposed to do? Like, I don't even know how to do this job anymore. And I, I mean, I've done this job for a little while. I've yeah. done this just long enough that people have asked me to come speak about it. And yet I'm <laughs> staring at a computer not knowing what to do. And I was just in a fog. And I think what happened was um, I did a lot of work and a lot of prayer to find clarity. And when I got that clarity, that's when I started seeing myself again. And mm -hmm. so if you're in that moment in your life where you kind of feel like, man, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I recognize myself or these are, this isn't my armor or I'm lost. Fight for clarity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, and, and I know that you've, you've done physical moves. So how have you stayed in touch with some of the people that know you? Uh, cause you've moved around a little bit more recent in the last couple of years. So how do you get those people to tell you, to moved. look in the mirror with you? Yeah, so it's funny. I moved, you know, I moved from Nashville to Florida, Florida to Charlotte. Now I'm moving back to Nashville in like 30 days. And so um, what's been amazing is the relationships had such great roots that I didn't, you know, with the exception of one person probably, I haven't lost any of my relationships. And so I still talk to those people all the time. I still communicate with them. I still do life with the, like that most of my team would come out and see me at different places where we lived and it was it's just been it's god's grace honestly yeah. like god's grace and and um you know i read i don't know if you've read the book um the last era by erwin mcmanus but in the book he talks about tribe and he talks about, about the the and i think had i read that book before i left nashville i may not have left just because I've learned that tribe matters most and hmm. um, being around the people that you're most connected with, you can pretty much get through anything when you're around your people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I know for a lot of creative people, I mean, I haven't read Ir Irwin McManus's book. I know I've heard him talk about it on another podcast. So I have a, I think I, I have like the over, I have the Coles notes of it, but he's this creative <laughs> artistic guy, which yeah. often is characterized as like the lone wolf uh mm -hmm. you know introvert who yeah who spends a lot of time alone and maybe doesn't naturally go to large groups of people for connection um and so yeah what it, what's whether from you or from him can you give us a sort of a sense of that how to for the creative like the community piece where do they get that why does it matter <laughs> yeah, find, find the people that you trust and when you trust somebody go all in on them hmm and the four agreements, live the four agreements with them. And when you start doing that, you'd create roots in a relationship. If you think about it in your personal life, the best relationships you have are the ones that have roots. 
how do you get roots? You get roots by going through and digging stuff up and friction and love yeah. and moments. And a lot of time. And time and investment. Yeah. And that's what you have to do. You got to go find, you find the, the people you like it, whether it's 200 people or two people or one person, invest in that person and let them be your person and be yeah. honest with them and love them and don't judge them and see what happens. Yeah. And I think especially for the the person who is creative, who you know wants to sell their their work to the church, but doesn't really want to be part of the church. Mm-hmm. I'm always nervous about that person. It's in the same way as you talk about, like when you're looking to hire people, you're hopefully they're going to be, they're going to be rising up out of volunteer positions because they've already been actively involved in the community. Whereas, you know, I'm seeing in the, in the world of creative and communications, there's a lot of people who provide products and services yep. um, and lots and everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got advice to give <laughs> Yeah, on their podcasts or blogs or videos but like are they actually in it themselves or are they sitting in their little basement office alone coming up with these ideas without the context of a community in which it's coming like it's it's rooted out of yeah pra- having practitioner experience applied to your um consulting environment you know i think i think you know you gotta have you gotta have case study. You gotta have proof. Yeah, I can sit and I mean, I could tell Kanye West how to make a rap record, but if I'm not in the studio with him, it's not gonna work. Yeah. And so, so get in the studio. You know, yeah. even if it's volunteer, you can have the God may be giving you the best ideas to share with people, but go practice them and make sure they work. And you'll be you'll be amazed at what you find out when you start practicing them. Yeah, that's yeah, really good. And so. Um... What do you think is, what, where do you think we're headed? We, the church, in terms of, I mean, that's a huge question, but I'm talking about in particularly in creative, you know. They're talking about living in their basement. That's how I'd have to answer that question. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's, there's um, contracts and staff. There's, um, there's bigger and smaller. There's the online and digital spaces. What are some things that when you're looking ahead, in the next five years, what, what what are you seeing as trends or what are you excited about that's bubbling so, up? I think one thing for sure is that um, <clears throat> I feel like the church has kind of acted like the music business when it comes to digital. Hmm. We try to fight to get people to come to our box, but the reality is they th- their lives are busier, faster, more complex than they've ever been. They want to engage in our content. Um, <coughs> they're not gonna necessarily be able to ga- engage in that content the way that, that we did or our parents did. And so being intentional with your next platforms, um, making sure that your your message is the, is the center and then coming out of that is all the spokes. One of my friends works at a really big church in, in Atlanta and he said that their giving is up, their attendance is up. I'm sorry, their giving is up, their serving is up, their attendance is down. Mm-hmm. Um, and people will come and serve a service and then go home and watch it online. And uh, so without question, I think everyone needs to be focused on their online experience, whatever that looks like for you in your world, whether it's an audio podcast, uh, whether it's social media, whether it's your website, whether it's streaming on Facebook, find ways to find additional on ramps for people to engage your platform and your, your message and what God's trying to tell you for your community. And um, if you don't do that, um, someone else will. Yeah. And, like I can listen to Judah Smith every week. I can listen to Stephen Furtick every week. So I don't have to go to a local church, but I want to go to a local church because I want to be engaged in a community. But if my community gave me that same opportunity, wow, what would I do? You know? Yeah. 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 Oh, and it's true. And I mean, of course, there are things that we need to be thoughtful of, nervous about, even like theologically. I have I have questions around how we baptize people on the internet and take communion together and, you know, lay hands in prayer and, and a few other things. But but I think that the, f- the faster technology develops, probably the less questions I will have about some of those things. Um, right. and, we, and we know that young, like the younger, I don't know, the under 40 year olds, online community is real community. It's not secondary. It is community. 
And yep. so how do we serve people where they are, not where we wish they were? Exactly. And how do we make sure that we're providing them the on-ramps to community, to purpose and community? Those, those, that's what people look for. People look for purpose and they look for community. When they can plug in and become part of something like that, man, life gets awesome. If we don't provide them that, somebody else will. Yeah. And so just as a kind of a last question, similar along similar lines, but it's this idea of obviously we're in a divisive time. The church is um, facing challenges that are, are, I mean, we've always had challenges. Every generation has challenges and social concerns and political concerns that come up and cause the church to shake a little bit. I mean, shake inside itself. <laughs> and how, how can creative people be part of healing that, be part of bringing people together? Uh, what, 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 what's, what, what can creative people do to, to be part of the solution? <laughs> Great question. Um, I don't know that it's always necessary to be part of the solution. Hmm. I think sometimes it's, it just helps to frame the problem. Yeah. And, and, and so sometimes those problems are the things that are actually going to help us grow and develop and become who God wants us to be and what God wants his church to look like. And so sometimes it's just framing the problem in a healthy way as opposed to being the solution. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, probably the biggest problems, the solution is the same, Jesus. Right. And so it's figuring out how to create the, the question in the way that brings people to that answer. Right. Yeah, being able to cl communicate clearly, look, this is the thing. Let's yeah. not pretend it's not here. Yep. Let's exactly. look at it. Let's talk about it. Let's find words for it. No question. Yeah. No, I love that. Well, uh, thank you so much for uh, a little hangout today. Um, oh, where can people... Sorry, sorry go ahead. <laughs> no, thank you. Thanks for letting me be part and for, for letting me, like, access to your, to your tribe. And uh, it means more than you could ever imagine. Oh, man. Well, you know, I think that... I don't speak just for myself. I know even even on my own staff, there's people who uh, on my on my own church who talk about you and, and admire who you are, what you do, where you're going. And, you know, even just as you've been so open to share a little bit about your own personal journey going through through that, that there's there's a lot of stuff that comes at us in life. And then to come out the other side and still say, I love Jesus. I love the church. It's a hope. It's the hope of the world. It's the hope for all of us, and exactly. and uh, that there's something really valuable to give ourselves towards it. I mean, I, that's, that's why I want to have conversations with, with people like you. <laughs> so, so uh, where can people find you um, on the internets? So, StephenBrewster.me, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, B-R-E-W-S-T-E-R dot M-E. That's my blog. All my contact info is there. I'm sure my phone number's on there somewhere too, so you can probably find that and text me. Uh, you can hit me up on Instagram or any of those other networks. And yeah, that's the best way. Awesome. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you. Well, that was such an awesome conversation with Brewster. If you're like me, you might have paused, rewound, listened again, or wanted to write something down that he said. He's just full of wisdom and uh, rich resource to us as creatives and communicators. So you want to find him online, stephenbrewster.me, or on Instagram, B underscore Rooster, B underscore R-E-W-S-T-E-R. -E -E you can see behind the scenes on some of the projects he's working on with churches all over the U.S. and sort of get into his brain a little bit. And how he thinks as a creative leader. You're going to love it. Now, next week on the podcast, we're talking to my own pastor, the reverend, the doctor, Jonathan Thompson. John Thompson, or JT as we call him, he's from C4 Church. It's a multi-site church in the Toronto area, and that's the church that I go to. It's a church that I get the privilege to work on the staff of. And John is really um, a theologian and a thinker, but he's also thoughtful as a communicator to our culture in this post-modern, post-Christian time. So you're going to love this conversation. You're going to hear stuff about the theology of art and creativity that I don't think that you've heard before. Some ideas that are interesting and new for us as thoughtful creatives. 
We're going to be talking about this, the title of this podcast, Word Made Digital. Why is Jesus called the Word? Why not choose another word for him? Why did um, the book of John call him the Word Made Flesh? What's the significance of that? We're going to be talking, too, about what would he as a senior leader want creatives and communicators to know and how can they uh, better serve their senior leaders in what they do and communicate better and have more synergy. We're going to be looking at um, just generally creative work in the church and what What's needed in this area across the nation as we are reaching people in a post-Christian culture. So share, pass us along, review and rate. It would help us get the word out to more people if you do that. See you next week. Thanks for listening to the Word Made Digital Podcast with Joanna LaFleur. Head over to joannalafleur.com for more practical tools, interviews, and videos for creatives and communicators. We'd love to help you be the best you can be at communicating the best news in the world. Tap that subscribe button.